So last class, we stopped at step four, right? Because uh, remember, we are following this algorithm, the algorithm in, um, in page 684, right? That can help us or give us an idea of how to design a heat exchanger, shell and tube heat exchanger step by step. So last class, we stopped at the step four. That was to get the delta T log difference and the correction factor from the graph, right? And then the corrected log mean temperature difference. Then um, we are ready for the step five, that is the calculation of the heat transfer area. Heat transfer area equals the duty or heat transfer rate divided by uh, log mean temperature difference that we calculate in the uh, in the previous slide, right? And the uh, overall heat transfer coefficient that is 300 because remember that we established it as 300 from figure or the table, right? So we have, we, we established the overall heat transfer coefficient being around 300, uh, 300 watt meter square Celsius times the delta T corrected temperature of 75. And um, here on top, we have the duty, right? So with the duty, overall heat transfer coefficient and delta T log, we get an area of 70.86. We have here 10 to the three to remove what? The kilowatts, remember that we got kilowatts for the duty. That's why we have the 10 to the three to change to watts. So step six would be to set up the layout and tube size. And this is something is going to change uh, from team to team guys because some of you will be uh, selecting some kind of layout and some of you will select it a different one. For example, this problem is showing us that they select a split ring floating head exchanger for efficiency and easy to clean, right? Because if we, for example, use a fixed set layout, we have the problem of what? Of cleaning outside the tubes, right? And also, we don't have that possibility of having free expansion of the material. Um, now we need to select from uh, the fluid routing. So neither fluid is corrosive and the operating pressure is not high. So plain carbon steel can be used for the shell and tubes. Okay, again, the material selection depends on the tubes, on the tubes, oh, sorry, on the fluids that you are using. Um, so plain carbon steel was the selection here. Uh, the crude is dirtier than the kerosene, so put the crude to, through the tubes and the kerosene in the shell, right? And this is also in agreement with uh, with the textbook, um, the textbook uh, recommendations and also the recommendations we went through last class, right? Or where to route one or the other. So the dirtier, uh, the dirtier one that is the crude in this one, in this case is going to be going through the tubes. Um, use 19.05 millimeters or three, four inch outside diameter, 14.83 millimeter inside diameter, five meter long tubes. Why? Because this is a popular size. So that means we have it available pretty easy. That is the logic behind choosing these kind of tubes on a triangular 23.81 millimeter pitch, pitch to diameter ratio 1.25. So uh, these are the specifications that the book is providing based on uh, having these kind of tubes readily available. And uh, the, triangular, the triangular pitch, why the triangular pitch? The kerosene that is the dirtier, sorry, the crude that is the dirtier fluid is going to go inside the tubes. So outside the tubes, you will have the kerosene that is not as dirty as the crude. So essentially, if you put a triangular arrangement, it's not going to be that difficult to clean, right? Even though the tubes are close together because it's not as dirty as the inside fluid, right? So remember, Everything that you propose for your design should have some reasoning behind. Uh, why you choose that? Well, because it is common, triangular, because I, accom I can accommodate more tubes, and also I will have the dirtier fluid inside the tube, so that means 
that outside the tubes I will have the most kind of clean fluid, so it will be easier for me to clean even though I have a triangular pitch. Uh, step seven, the number of tubes. So we need fresh area of one tube, neglecting the thickness of the tube sheet. Why? Because we assume they are so thin, right, that we can neglect first. So we do pi times the outside diameter times the length of the tube. The outside diameter in millimeters, we said that it's going to be 19.05, right? Uh, so here I'm changing to meters, right? 10 to the minus three millimeters to meters by DL. L, five meter long. The common size I selected. And that gives me an area of 0.2992 meters square. Then we are ready to calculate the number of tubes, right? The number of tubes is going to be the heat transfer area, a knot that I have here on top. And there is a typo here in the book. It says 70.89 and should be this number. Um, so a knot, the one that I calculate in a step five, heat transfer area, divided by uh, the area the area of one tube neglecting thickness of the tube sheet, that is 0 0.2999 meters squared. That gives me around 237 tubes. And as we always tend to over design, right, we are going to say, okay, this is around 240. So I'm going to start with a num total number of tubes of 240. Uh, we said that we are going to have two passes, two two passes. So that would give us uh, 240 divided by 120. So for two passes, tubes per pass are going to be 120. 240 divided by two, right? At this point, we need to check the tube side velocity to see if it looks reasonable. Uh, so let's start with the tube cross-sectional area because we need the tube cross-sectional area to calculate the tube side velocity. So tube cross-sectional area pi d squared, right? Pi d squared over four. Pi d squared inside diameter because it's inside the tube, the velocity inside the tube, right? So pi d in divided, pi d squared divided by four gives me 0 0.0001727 meters square, right? So Area per pass is going to be the number of tubes per pass, right, times the tube cross-sectional area. That is the, num the number that we just got. So area per pass is 0 0.02073 meters square. We are ready then for the volumetric flow rate, right? We have here the mass flow rate given in the data, right, divided by 3,600 to remove again the hours like we have been doing and have seconds times the one over the mean density or the temperature for the crude oil at the mean temperature, 820. So crude oil, if you go to the properties, crude oil, remember that we read properties or the problem give us properties at the mean temperature between inlet and outlet. The density at that mean temperature is 820, and is the 820 I have in here, here, to change mass flow rate to volumetric flow rate, right? Now that I have the volumetric flow rate, I can just divide the volumetric flow rate by the area per pass, area per pass that we calculate here of 0 0.02073. That gives me a tube side velocity of 1.14 meters per second. At this point, uh, the velocity doesn't seem that bad, but we cannot be for sure that this velocity uh, makes sense until we calculate the pressure drop, okay? If the pressure drop doesn't mean the allowed pressure drop defined in a problem statement, we need to come back and work with this velocity, okay? So for now, uh, we are going to keep it like that. At least it's not a crazy number, right? Um, it seems reasonable. 
Um, then uh, let's go through the step eight. That is uh, the bundle and shell diameter. So we need to calculate the bundle diameter. And for that, we need to use this equation, 12.3b and the table 12.4. So let's go to that table. So if you can locate that table. So this is the equation, the equation 12.3b that help us to, to estimate the bundle diameter. But if you see the bundle diameter equation requires the tube outside diameter that we already have it because we already determined what size of tubes we are using, right? Uh, the number of tubes that we also already determined, but it requires also these N and K values, right? So we need to read these values depending on the number of tube passes, as you can see here. How many passes we said we are going to have? Two. So this is the one that we are going to read. Why? Because we also said that we are going to have a triangular pitch. Check that if you are going to have a square pitch, you will read in this area of the table, right? But we are using a triangular pitch and two two passes. So these are our numbers for K1 and N1. Okay, so we can put numbers then to get the bundle diameter and you have them in here. So the bundle diameter, 19.09, that is the outer diameter that we determine here, right, for the tubes we are using, times the number of tubes divided by um, the K value one over the N value. That gives me a bundle diameter of 428 millimeters or 0.43 meters. Also, we said that we will have a spring ring floating heat head exchanger. So we need to get the shell clearance, okay? And that we get from figure 1210. So let's go to figure 1210 to see that we can get this 56 millimeters of clearance. Here, right? So we calculate a bundle diameter of 428 millimeters or around 0.43 meters. This is the bundle diameter that we already calculated, right? But in meters. Then we have a split floating head. Remember, if you choose a different way or a different geometry for your head, you need to, you need to read in different lines here in this graph. Okay, so that depends on your design, guys. So the bundle diameter in meters, 0.43 more or less, a split, a split ring floating head. So we will have a shell inside diameter or shell clearance of around 56 millimeters. So with the clearance and the bundle, we can get the shell inside diameter. So the shell inside diameter is going to be the bundle diameter times the clearance that we read from figure 1210. So then we will have a shell inside diameter of 484 millimeters. We are ready for the step nine. That is to get the tube side heat transfer coefficient. Uh, to get heat transfer coefficients, what we do first? Yeah, get the Reynolds number to determine the nozzles. Um, so let's get the Reynolds number. And the, all these equations for the Reynolds and the prank guys, you have them in page 663 in this textbook. So if you want to locate them or mark them, they are there, page 663. So the Reynolds is going to be the density times the velocity that we just calculated from the mass flow rate um, times the inside diameter 
from the tubes that we selected divided by the, the viscosity of the crude oil, right, because we are working in the tube side, in the tube side we have the crude, at the mean temperature. So we have a Reynolds of around 4.3 10 to the 3. The brand is going to be the CP, the heat capacity times the viscosity times the thermal conductivity. Again, you have the formula for the Reynolds and the Prance in page 663 in this textbook or in this chapter. So heat capacity times viscosity divided by the thermal conductivity give us Prance of 48.96. The next step, because uh, we are following the method, the current method in this textbook, um, is to get the ratio of the length to the tubes to the inside diameter because we need to go to a figure to get the DJH value to calculate the nozzles. So length of the tubes times the inside diameter, right, gives me 337. Let's go to the figure, and it's going to be much easier when you see the figure 1223. So these are the equations from the nozzle, the Reynolds, and the Brandt. And the nozzle, you already know it by heart. It's H, diameter, thermal conductivity. The Reynolds and the Brandt are there, and they are in page 663. So we are using this correlation, figure 1250, sorry, equation 1215, to calculate the H value, the tube side heat transfer coefficient. So this is the equation that we are using for the H. All of this term in the left side is the nozzle, okay? And this is the equation that this current method to solve for shell and tube heat exchangers or design shell and tube exchangers proposed as a good correlation to calculate the H. So as you can see, this H equation or this equation for the convective heat transfer coefficient requires JH, that is a factor, right, that we need to get from this, the heat transfer factor that we need to get from this figure, times the Reynolds, times the brand that we already calculated, and the ratio of the viscosities. So we already have the Reynolds number, right, and we calculate the LD the LD value or the length to the tubes to inside diameter ratio. And that value was around 337, right? So with the Reynolds and L over D value, we can get the heat transfer factor here to the left side of this plot. So we can put it in this equation and calculate the H or the tube side heat transfer coefficient. So then put numbers in this equation, and let's calculate the tube side heat transfer coefficient. So from here, 1223, we get the JH factor of 3.10 to the 3, more or less, to the minus 3. So we can get the nozzles, and out of the nozzle, the H. So we get an H of around 450 to watt meter square Celsius. This is the nozzle, guys. This is the thermal conductivity of the crude oil at mean temperature. And this is the inside diameter. Why? Because we are in the tube side. We're analyzing the tube side, right? So again, nozzle, thermal conductivity of the crude oil at the mean temperature, and the inside diameter of the tubes we selected. We have a tube side heat transfer coefficient of 45, 45 to watt meter square Celsius. And the problem says this is clearly too low if the overall heat transfer coefficient is going to be 300. The tube side velocity did look low, so increase the number of passes to four. This will have the cross-sectional area in each pass and double the velocity. And at this point, this might be not something very clear for you, 
So what happens when you start doing your first design, you might keep going with these values and realize until you reach the overall heat transfer coefficient later in the design that this value was too small. So then you need to come back, okay? The book is showing this just to cut the number of iterations or calculations, but since it's going to be your first design, you might not realize this at this point and continue like that, okay? But you will realize that once you are obtaining the overall heat transfer coefficient, uh, you will realize that you might need to increase the tube side heat transfer coefficient in order to achieve the overall heat transfer coefficient of 300, okay? So the book is doing it at this point. Again, to reduce the number of iterations, you might not be able to realize this at this point, and that's totally fine. Uh, what is going to happen? You will have more iterations than whatever the book is required. So the tube side velocity did look low, so increase the number of tube passes to four. This will have the cross-sectional aid in each pass and double the velocity. So the new velocity is going to be the old velocity times two, right? So with that new velocity, we we'll get a new Reynolds, a new um, JH factor from figure 1223, and a new uh, tube side heat transfer coefficient. Okay, and I think I have the plot so you can see the new H for the new velocity. So doubling the velocity, we now have a Reynolds of 8.7, 10 to the three. Uh, we have the same LD, right? Because we are not changing the tube, the tubes are the same, right? We are just increasing the passes. And we have a new heat transfer factor of 3.8, 10 to the minus three. Again, I put this factor into the 12, 0.15 equation to get a new tube side heat transfer coefficient. So we, we have a new, um, a new value, right, for the tube side heat transfer coefficient with doubling the velocity that is here. Um, so we increase the, the tube side heat transfer coefficient. That means that we might be already increased the overall heat transfer coefficient near 300. But again, some, it's something that you might not be able to visualize at this point until we reach the overall heat transfer calculation. And that means you need to go back to step nine at that point. Step 10, shell side heat transfer coefficient. We need all the heat transfer coefficients for the overall heat transfer coefficient, right? So now let's move towards the shell. We are using Kern's method that is in this chapter, in chapter 12 I share with you. and we already said that we will have uh, four tube passes. So with four tube passes, the shell diameter will be larger than the one calculated for two passes, right? Because now they are passing four times, so you expect a larger shell. So we need, again, to calculate the bundle, the bundle diameter. Again, we go for equation 12.3. So if you can see, these are all iterations, guys correcting and correcting and correcting until you have your best design. Um, again, we go to equation 12.3, now to correct for four passes because the shell is going to be bigger than for two because we start assuming two two passes. So with the change of four two passes, the shell diameter will be larger than the one calculated for two passes. So again, we keep the triangular pitch but now we will have four passes. That means that our K and N values are going to change. So we need to recalculate the bundle diameter as we did before, right? So let's go back. Um, so now we have a new bundle, bundle diameter, right? And um, with this bundle diameter, again, we need to get a new shell clearance, right? So that give us um, around um, the bundle to shell clearance is around 56, giving 506 millimeters. So 450 plus 56 gives me 506, right? So now we need to do trials with the baffle spacing. And the first, the first trial uh, could be uh, the bundle to shell clearance, right? 
divided by five. That would be around 100. So 506 divided by five, around 100. Um, this spacing should be uh, give a good heat transfer without too high pressure drop. So let's check that. So we need to first to calculate the area for cross flow. That is this one. And you have this, this equation. In equa this equation is equation 1221. Uh, so please check equation 1221 in page 672. And mark it because you will need this for your design project. These equations are pretty important, guys, because we are following the Cairns method. So equation 1221 for the for the cross flow height for the cross flow uh, the area of cross flow sorry and also check equation 1223 for hydraulic diameter of the shell for a triangular pitch. So 1221 and 1223. So we get then the the area for cross flow of 0.01012 meter square and the hydraulic diameter of the shell being 13.52. We are ready to calculate the volumetric flow rate on the shell size. And it's going to be again, mass flow rate divided by 3600 to eliminate the hours divided by one over the mean average density of kerosene. Now we are working with kerosene because kerosene goes into the shell. Important, the shell, we are using a hydraulic diameter, right? Because we don't have a circular cross-sectional area as we have for the tubes. Let's get the velocity in the shell. So we can get the Reynolds, then the Brand, then the nozzles, and then the shell heat transfer coefficient. So shell side velocity is going to be the volumetric flow rate um, that we just got in here, right? And it has a typo, right? Here, as you can see, there's a typo. It is volumetric flow rate uh, divided by the area of cross flow, the area of cross flow that we obtained with equation 1221. We have the velocity we are ready for, the Reynolds. So the Reynolds, again, we use the same equation we used previously, uh, right? That is going to be the density of the kerosene at the mean temperature, right? Times the velocity in the shell side, times the hydraulic diameter of the shell, divided by the viscosity of the kerosene at the mean temperature. So this gives me a Reynolds of 70, 17 to 14, or 1.7 to the fourth. We are ready for the PRANS. PRANS is CP, a specific heat of the kerosene at the mean temperature, uh, times the viscosity of the kerosene at the mean temperature, divided by the thermal conductivity of kerosene at the mean temperature. So that's why it's very important that in step two, you, you build a very nice table with all the properties, guys, for all the currents, so you can come back all the time to this to this uh, table. Otherwise, it can be messy. Uh, we have so many properties in here. Then we need to propose the baffle cut. And we have some guidelines through the chapter and also through the presentation I gave to you. Uh, the book is proposing 25% cut. And that we said that is something within range for liquids. Right? So the book is going for that. It's going, it's going for the lower limit for liquids. And again, I need that in your uh, design project, you, um, you uh, explain why you choose this or certain cut. Okay? This is in the lower limit for liquids. Uh, use segmental baffles with 25% cut. This should be a, a reasonable heat transfer coefficient without too large pressure drop. For the, uh, for the shell side uh, H value, we are going to use equation 1225. 
and a new figure for this JH factor is figure 1229. Okay, so we are using current method, and these are the equations I uh, I use or the book used to calculate the area for cross flow and also the hydraulic diameter for triangular pitch. So essentially it's following the Kant method in chapter 12. Um, so we have this equation, equation 1225, to calculate the H value for the shell. Okay, uh, be sure you don't confuse the 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 graphs for doing these kind of readings. So we calculate the Reynolds with the hydraulic diameter already, right? And we got a value of around point one point seven ten to the four. And here you have to choose uh, which line to read with the baffle cut. We says we are going to assume a baffle cut of twenty five percent. So it will be our twenty five percent line. That is the second one, right? And we go all the way to the left to read now the heat transfer factor that we are going to use in this H value for the shell or this H value equation for the shell. I read 4.52 10 to the minus 3. Everyone read the same or nearby? So once we have this correction factor, let's calculate the H value out of the equation 1225 for the shell. So from the figure 1229, the factor is 4.52 10 to the minus three, neglecting the viscosity correction, right? So again, we are neglecting the viscosities we get the H value for the shell. And um, here on top, we have the thermal conductivity of kerosene at the mean temperature, the hydraulic diameter of the shell. We have the JH uh, factor here. We have the Reynolds and the Prance to the 0.33. That again is equation 12.25. Troubles in getting the H value for the shell? No? Okay. Next step, overall heat transfer coefficient, right? We have the H values for the shell. We have the H values for the tubes. We are given the fooling factor, so we are ready for the overall heat transfer coefficient, right, guys? So uh, overall heat transfer coefficient, we have here 1 over H I, that is the tube side heat transfer coefficient that we calculate in page 687, times the fooling factor for the crude stream, this one, this value, that is given in the problem statement. And if it is not given, what you do? You read from tables. Uh, times the outside diameter of the tube here that we selected, divided by the inside diameter of the tube, again, that we selected, Again, we have here inside and outside, same thing, uh, the diameter, 2 times 55. This 55 is the thermal conductivity, guys, of the carbon steel, because we said we are going to use carbon steel chips. Okay, so 55 thermal conductivity of carbon steel plus 1 over the shell side heat transfer coefficient times the kerosene stream fooling factor given in the problem statement. So the sum of all the resistances there, right? We can get the overall heat transfer coefficient. When we have an overall heat transfer coefficient of 386 watt meter square per Celsius. That is above the initial estimate of 300. Then what we can do? Reduce the number of tubes. Uh, but before reducing the number of tubes, it is important to check the pressure drop. So as you can see, this is going, what you are going to do in your design project, and you might require even more iterations than the, than the book is doing here. 